Have you ever prayed before? We all have. Anybody who's ever visited church, even people who don't go to church, let them get into a life-threatening crisis, and guess what happens? They'll figure out how to pray. But just because they prayed, just because they were saying something, really didn't mean that something changed. And yet, if we're not careful in the church world, if we're around that environment enough, we'll begin to think that it's something we need to do out of discipline or it's an appropriate thing, but we lose expectation of a delivery, a return. It's like sowing and never expecting a harvest. Planting seeds in your backyard but never expecting anything to have a result. A lot of Christians have no expectation of a result in prayer, and yet James tells us that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person, one translation says, produces much change or produces much gain. God wants us to know through his word that, hey, listen, I want you to know when you ask, I hear it. And the Bible even says when we pray in alignment with the word that we can have confidence that he's heard our prayer. And that if he's heard it, then we have the result of what we're asking for. Your Heavenly Father wants you to know right where you're sitting, right where you're at, that you have the ability as his child to not only say a prayer, but to pray a prayer that gets a response. To pray a prayer that has an answer. To see a difference. Like I've said before, find me someone who does a lot of complaining, and I'll show you someone who doesn't do much praying. Because when you pray, then you don't have to complain about a situation. If things go on, go on, on the wrong path in your life, in any area of your life, you don't have to complain about it. You just know, I need to get alone and spend some time and pray about it. Because your prayer goes to heaven, and with the power of God and the promise of God, you can see the results come into your life. Can I get an amen? amen. Can I get a better amen? amen? You guys are awesome today. And so many times in life, people... Either don't pray, Jesus said, and it's in the Word of God, New Testament, in James, that you have not because you ask not. But sometimes people pray and there's no power there. And so in this series coming out of Ephesians, we've been talking about the ingredients, if you will, a recipe, if you might, of how to have a powerful prayer. What ingredients do you need to empower your prayer so that you know that it's being heard, but also you can see a difference? God doesn't want you just to pray and burn the energy. He wants you to pray knowing knowing that you're going to have some change as a result. How would our prayers change if we approach God knowing that he not only hears it, but he also answers it and that we can receive it? What would, what would our perspective be different if all of a sudden we begin to look at our prayer life as if I need something changed in my life? Now, you can't control other people's lives. God didn't give you authority. You can pray that God would send people in their path that would speak words of due season that would uh, maybe God could use to touch your life. But your prayers can't force people to do something. If your prayers could force somebody to do something and you could override their will, then you should pray that everyone gets saved because it's the will of the Father that none should perish. But if God doesn't override people's will, you can't override people's will. Amen. So we pray for people, and that was the, our first ingredients as we looked at Ephesians. In fact, let's read this together, and we're going to throw it on the screen. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. You can look at it in your Bible, or you can look to the screen. I'd like for us to continue this pattern of reading it together out loud, because it's important that you spend time reading the Bible. Can I get an amen? amen. Are you ready for this? All right, I'll give you a one, two, three count, and then we'll start. Ready? One, two, three, go. Power of his might. It's the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet filled with the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions 
all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Give yourself a hand clap. You did fantastic. Let's open with, with prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together. We thank you for the truth of your word that brings freedom and liberty. We thank you that your word says where two or three are gathered together in your name, that you are here. So, Father, we open up our hearts, our minds, our understanding. We ask you to speak into our lives today. Let not, let not one person today leave this place without experiencing your presence, the truth and power of your word. We worship you today. Just lift your hands before the Lord right now. Father, we worship you today. We shake off every distraction. We shake off every attack of the enemy. We shake off every burden that would weigh us down today. And Father, we have chosen to, to prioritize you and your word in our life today. We sanctify this moment by the blood of Jesus, and we decree and declare that Jesus, you are Lord. In the midst of every situation, let that come out of our mouth. In the midst of any season and every season, let that come out of our mouth. Your Lordship, Lord Jesus, your truth, your word. And I thank you, Father God, that heaven and earth will see. They, they know already, but they will see in our lives the manifestation, the reality of your word coming and developing, demonstrating, displaying in a manner that cannot be denied by the enemy, cannot be denied by those who are against us, cannot be denied by anyone around us, that they will see your goodness in the land of the living. They will see your goodness, Father God. They will see, let every person here begin to see and experience your goodness, for you are good, and there's none like you. And we give you praise, and everyone said, Amen. I've never, like I said before, I've never taught out of the armor of God as a ingredient, recipe, if you will, for prayer. But as I studied this, this is a different perspective, and I believe it, it works, and I've been getting blessed. Hopefully you've been blessed out of it. We're working from the, the last of the verse all the way up. In quick review, we've talked about the recipe for powerful prayers. The first one was pray for other people. Yeah. If your prayers are only about you, you'll probably find that your prayers have no power because all of a sudden, everything's focused just about you. It's not that your needs aren't important. It's not that God doesn't notice it or you don't have a situation. But the Bible tells us in Job that when Job began to pray for his friends, God turned it and restored back to him twice what he had lost. James says you have not because you ask not. You fight and you're getting around, getting around fighting with people because you want what they have and then you don't have it because you don't ask. But when you do ask, you ask with the wrong motivation because everything's about consuming stuff, stuff to your comfort and to your own passion and desires. You don't care. Many Christians don't have any uh, qualification in their prayer because their motivation is all about what they want. They haven't found out, God, what do you want in this situation? Lord, what do you want to do? Everything's about me, 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 satisfy me, make me happy. And God wants you to be happy. But if your top priority is your happiness, you'll find out you'll be missing the joy of the Lord. Don't shout me down, church. Pray for others. Say, pray for others. Pray for others. And I love that because through the context of Ephesians, it's talking about you being in battle. But he said, pray for other people. Pray for other people. Pray for other people. Because what you sow or make happen in others, God will make happen in you. You might not get a list of people saying, I'm praying for you, but I know God has the ability. That's where we trust the Lord. The Holy Spirit can orchestrate and coordinate the hearts of people that are sensitive toward Him. Have you ever been there? All of a sudden, you just had a tug from the Lord, I need to begin to pray. Maybe you knew who you were praying for. Maybe you didn't know who you were praying for, but you knew it was an urgent moment to pray. The Lord knows how to coordinate his body. He knows how to coordinate his army. He knows how to call those to come and tell those to go when he needs them to for those who are sensitive to the things of God. But when you get into God's system, are you listening to me, child of God? When you get into God's way of doing things. See, what short circuits our prayer many times is we see from a limited point of view. Paul even said, on this side of eternity, I see through a glass darkly or smudge, which means I don't see everything. I, it's not all clear to me. But when I get to heaven, it will all make sense. And that's why you have to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, the word of God says, and he will direct your path. We got to trust the system of God. And when he says pray for other people, there's reasons 
about that that you don't fully understand, that I don't fully understand. But God has a way. Do you hear me? God has a way. God has a way that you begin to pray for somebody and he'll call upon seven people to pray for you. You might not see it. You might not ever hear it. But I'm telling you, this is a real thing. And God has a way of bringing prayers for, towards you and for you. And you don't even know it. Why? Because you're just obeying what the Lord tells you to do. And even in the midst of attack, you say, I'm, I'm, my feelings have been hurt. I've been so wounded. I've been so disappointed. And instead of just praying for yourself, say, Lord, I'm going to find somebody to encourage. I'm going to go find somebody I can pray for. I'm going to go to the hospital and pray and encourage somebody else. What are you doing? You're getting your eyes off yourself. You're beginning to release because when you begin to pray for other people, what you don't see in the natural and you begin to discover through maturity is that when you begin to help other people, when you begin to let God use you to encourage and pray for other people, you yourself unrealizing it in the natural, but you begin to connect with the presence and power of God for them. And when you are connecting to the Word and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit for somebody else, guess what? God God says, you'll not be left dry. Uh, you, while you are being used by God for somebody else, you get the benefit too. Someone, if you believe that, give the Lord a shout of amen. We found the second ingredient that we've talked about. When you pray, if you want powerful prayers, always have, according to the text, it said the sword of the Spirit. Always have the Word of God. Let the word of God define the promise. Let the promise and word of God define for you the level of your prayer. You say, oh, I'm praying for it. What scripture do you have? If you can't quote a scripture and it's referenced quickly, you know what that tells me? You have not spent a lot of time on that verse. You don't need to know 50 verses. Get one or two and spend time thinking about it, praying over it, memorizing it, speaking it so you can hear Romans 10, 17, faith comes by here. And so that when the devil tries to poke you, you know what comes out of your mouth? Just like when Jesus was tempted, that he didn't have to say, let me think about it. He said, it is written. He didn't say, let me go to the temple where they keep the scrolls so I can find something. He said, it is written. Do you know what happens? A lot of Christians, when the devil attacks them, they have no reference of anything coming out of their spirit because it's like a well. They have not put anything in. They have not put anything in. But I'm here to tell you that I know many of you, you know what I'm talking about. When you've spent time in the Word of God, are you listening to me today? When you have spent time reading the Word and meditating on the Word, you don't have to remember it. For Jesus said the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance what I've said. It just comes out of your innermost being. It'll come out of you. It'll bubble up and all of a sudden when the devil begins to taunt you in your mind, you won't think, oh no, you'll say it is written and you'll quote the verse and you'll have the reference and you'll have the context of it. Why? Because it's the sword of the spirit. It's the word of God. Amen. You say, I, I don't think, I think it's just hearing the word and just reading it. No, it's you speaking it. Yes. I'll give you an example of it. Revelation 1 and John heard a voice behind him and he turned and when you begin to read Revelation 1 as he saw Jesus, it talks about his hair. It talks about the fire in his eyes, but it also says that he has a two-edged sword in his mouth. The Bible tells us that the word of God is, is like a two-edged sword. Sharper than any two edges. What happens? It was in the mouth of Jesus. You say, well, I don't know what that's for. I'm glad you don't. Let's, let's look into it farther. Revelation 19. It says that Jesus one day in the future will come riding on the white horse. Oh, I just want to read it. It won't be on the screen. But I like this verse. Let me find it for you real quick. I like this verse. Revelation 19. Are you ready? It says, verse 11. Now I saw a heaven open and behold, a white horse. See, the Antichrist tries to show up on a white horse. Anti doesn't mean just against. Anti also means instead of. The Antichrist, there is an Antichrist spirit. There is an Antichrist person who will one day in our future, I don't know if it's in our lifetime, I believe it will, will try to show up and draw attention to himself as the replacement for Jesus. See, the devil doesn't create anything new. He, he imit, mocks and imitates what God does. He twists what God does. That's what the word wicked literally means. It's a twisting of something else. That's where you get the word wicker furniture. It's a twisting. The devil doesn't create anything new. He tries to imitate God to get you to look at him instead of God. To get you to focus on him instead of God. To get you to talk about what he's doing instead of what God's doing. 
How are you doing? Oh, it's, everything's going wrong. You spend all your time talking about what the devil's doing and not what God's doing. That's what God referred to to the spies as saying, hey, listen, who are you going to believe? The evil report? The majority that said there's no way there's giants in the promised land and it's the, the promised land is good just as God said. But we can never do it. We can't make it. We are grasshoppers in their, in their eyes. Well, how do they know how they looked to the, to the mind of the giant? They said, no, we can never take the land. We're too insignificant. No, we're too insignificant. It's impossible. And God called it an evil report. Was it factual? Yes, it was factual. But was it true? It was not true. Because two out of the minority instead of the majority. You, some of you are looking for a majority opinion to guide your life. You don't need the majority opinion. Wide is the road to destruction, Jesus said. And many find that. But narrow is the road to life. Oh, everybody's trending on, and this is trending. Everybody's doing it or saying it or living it. That might be your first red flag. You might not want to do it. Can I get a better amen? Yeah. But two out of, the, uh, out of the group, only two who had the spirit of faith, Joshua and Caleb, and they said, it is what God said. You know, if God told you of the promised land and you saw the goodness line up, the promised line up with what he already told you, don't you think he's well able to get you there? And they said, we are well able. For God will put them into our hands. What are he saying? Hey, listen, it's not about us. It's all about God. It's all about God. And God will take care of what we can't take care of. Quit trying to measure up against the problem. Measure the problem up against your God. And come out with the reality that with God, all things are possible. All things are possible, child of God. Never walk out of a, never walk out of a discussion. Anybody, if you talk to them and you walk out feeling insignificant or not enough, don't talk to them anymore. They're not from God. When you spend time in the Word of God, when you spend time in the presence of God, you'll walk out with your chest high, your head high, and no. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. If you, for those who are watching, if you ever attend the church and they begin to browbeat you and tell you that you'll never make it and you're, you're not good enough, you ought to just graciously get up and leave. You don't need to fight with them. You don't even have to condemn them. Just say, that's not my tribe. Israel had 12 tribes and the devil's got his tribe. You let people find their tribe. Amen. We're a tribe of God is well able. We're a tribe of, with God, we can do all things. And Joshua and Caleb said, oh, we, we are well able. They had the spirit of faith. You know, when you tie the word of God, the promise of God to your prayers, it changes. And so Revelation 19, Jesus, oh, I was reading that. Ooh, let's get back to that. And he sat on, it, uh, on a white horse, and he who sat on it was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. Oh, what a rude awakening for everybody who thinks Jesus is weak. What a rude awakening is going to come. You say, oh, no, he was weak. No, he, was, he allowed himself to be laid down as a lamb for the slaughter. But he said, no one takes my life. I lay it down willingly. In fact, during the process, he told the disciples, don't you know that I could, don't, easily, it was like shock, don't you realize, don't you know that I could ask of my father and he would send me an army of angels? Come on. Thousands of angels were at his disposal. Thousands of angels. You say, what can an angel do? We'll go back in the Old Testament where one angel wiped out an army. Yeah. One angel. And thousands of angels were at his disposal. No, when he was here before, he not only came to the, as an example, he came to be a substitute and to lay his life down on the cross of Calvary to pay for your sins. So he became sin so that you don't have to live in sin, so you don't have to be bound in sin, so that you can be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and miss hell and go to heaven and know your heavenly Father. If you believe that, give him a hand clap of praise. Verse 12, his eyes were like a flame of fire. 
Ooh, I can tell when people have the, are stirred up with the word of God. I can tell it in their eyes when they're praying in faith. I can tell it when they've got a hold of the word. I can also tell it when people are in fear when they pray. So many Christians are in fear and they're trying to pray in fear. You can't get power. You can't release power. You'll, all you're doing is praying in panic. Oh God, help me. Oh God, have mercy. That's not the prayer of faith. That's not a powerful prayer. A powerful prayer is not, Lord, help me make it just five more minutes. You have no promise for that. Line, the, line your prayer up to the promise of, God word, of God's word. That's the standard. That's the standard. And I'm telling you, when you tie your, the standard of your prayer to God's promise, you'll find it'll be way above, far above anything that you think is possible. Quit praying prayers that you yourself can fulfill. Quit praying prayers that you yourself can handle. Quit praying. There's no faith in that. Pray bold, audacious prayers that mean without God. It'll never happen. Come on, child of God. Begin to get a hold of the word and begin to pray what God says is available to you and your family. Bold prayers. Fire in his eyes. I think God is more insulted with weak prayers than no prayers. And his eyes were the flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. I'm going to read this because it's blessing me. I love you anyway, but I'm reading it. He had a name written on. He, excuse me. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. Verse 13. He was clothed with a, a, with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. I, wish, I, I, I just wish I was a better preacher. I'd go, the word of God. Mm, the word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on a white horse. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. He subdued, Hebrews tells us, that through faith they subdued kingdoms. They conquered kingdoms. What are they doing? The word, the sharp word in your mouth, it's not a powerful sword. It's not a sword until you get a revelation. But once you get a revelation, it moves out of your mind of what you can recall and talk about to something that's alive in your spirit. And when the enemy begins to attack you, you begin to pray, not out of weakness, not out of fear, not out of, I'm talking to somebody, quit praying out of panic. You have the strength of God, the word of God, and you begin to declare it and it begins to happen because you have the sword of the spirit yeah. hallelujah I love the word hallelujah the word works the word works the word works the word works every time we have too many times been conditioned by the church to stop believing the truth of the word. You've been in so many services. You've heard it before. It is lukewarm to your life, but I'm telling you, stir yourself up. The word works every time. Heaven and earth will pass and fail before the word fails. Stand on that word. Build your life on that word. Hear it, obey it, it works. I love the word. It works, it works, it works. It works, it works, it works. It'll heal, it'll save, it will deliver, it'll protect, it'll bring peace, it'll destroy the enemy's power. The word works. I love the word of God. Last week we talked about to empower your prayer, a recipe for a powerful prayer. The Bible says to put on the helmet of salvation. We call that the covenant mindset. When you pray, you don't pray as a servant. You don't pray as a beggar. You pray with confidence as a son and daughter of the Most High God. You are in covenant with Almighty God. You, that's a contract. You have a contract that has been set, set and sealed by Jesus and his blood on the cross of Calvary. So it's not about God, will you give? It's Lord, Lord I believe I receive. Why? Because it's already purchased. Hebrews 6, 12 and Hebrews eleven thirty three. 33, that through faith and patience, they inherit. They inherit the promises. They inherit the promises. They inherit the promises. That tells me it was already provided and you need to inherit it. Well, inheritance is always tied to death. Death, well, God won't die. He lives forever. Yeah, but he died on the cross for Jesus is the son of God. Are you with me? So when he died on the cross, guess what? It was all provided. 
Doesn't the Bible say that? He has is, he is given you all things that pertain into life and godliness. He has given you all things. Challenge everything I say with the word of God. Challenge every idea because I want you to dig. I just don't want you to hear it. I don't want you to just be encouraged by it. I just don't want you to like it. I want you to challenge it and dig and learn because it becomes a part of you and empowers you to pray powerful prayers. He's already given it to you, child of God. It's all yours in the covenant. It's all yours in the covenant. It's all yours in the contract. Hallelujah. Salvation. Save, sozo is the Greek word, solterior. It's so synonymous with everything that's in the covenant. So that even in James it says, let those who are sick call for the elders of the church. And let them pray the prayer of faith and the Lord will save the sick. What do you mean? Does that mean people say, does that mean they're not saved? No, in salvation is healing, hallelujah. For 1 Peter 2, 24 says, by whose stripes you were healed, hallelujah. Not going to be, you were. Healing's already yours. Do you see that? If you understand that healing's already yours, you, you might not have it. It's like having money in the account. You take your ATM card and said, I'm gonna give access. Someone has deposited. They've wired, transferred millions of dollars in my account. Then you go walk around and say, I'm a millionaire. Millionaire. Well, what car do you drive? That doesn't matter. I'm a millionaire. Well, what hush? I'm still accessing it. I'm a, the, the position has already been created. The deposit has already been transferred. It's all in your account. It's your name on it. You have ownership. Now, what do you do? You go to the bank and make a withdrawal. You go to the bank and say, I want access. That's what you're doing. I'm going to the bank of heaven and saying, It's already mine. And I believe I receive it. Mark 11 24. I'm accessing. What? Or so many times people are praying for God to do so. He's already entered his rest, Hebrews 4. It's all been done. It's all been done. He has completed the work and he is in rest. He is not doing more. It's all been done. You have to learn to access it. Yeah. Hallelujah! Woo, thank you, Jesus. Say, I'm a son or daughter of God. Say, I'm a child of God. For me, I don't say, I'm a son of God. If you're a daughter, say, I'm a daughter of God. Say it. Because of that, you can call him Abba Father, King James, Daddy God. You can boldly, 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 boldly enter his presence. Boldly pray. Anytime someone prays with a lot of protocol and properness and... Oh... The creator of all that is good. Who see it. They go down a road. They, they have no real relationship. They don't know him. But when you know him. That I might know him. And the power. Whew. Hang in there. Today. That was just review. I don't know how far we're going to get. But if we stop. We'll stop early. But we're having fun. I'm having fun. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16 is our key verse today. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. We talk about faith a lot about he around here. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing. Without faith you can't please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews. Through faith and patience, we inherit the promises of God. But you know, when you pray, before you pray and after your prayer, it's through a, there's still a time frame. Through faith and patience, there is a time frame. That's, Joyce Myers wrote a, an amazing book many years ago called The Battlefield of the Mind. It's in the process that the enemy's going to attack you. Sometimes he'll attack you when you're not, try to attack you when you're not expecting it, and he'll try to make you feel so hopeless that you feel like there's no even hope to pray. There's no reason to pray. Nothing can be done about this. Or others, you, you begin to have hope and you begin to pray and you believe that you receive it, but in the process of time, the devil will begin to whisper to you. I want you to look at this side of prayer that, uh, that's called the shield of faith. This side of the prayer that's called the shield of faith. Because prayer doesn't just stop after you uh, stop speaking. There is a shield of faith. Say there's a shield of faith. You have it, but you still have to take it. If you go to battle in the understanding of the way they had warfare, if you go to battle without a shield, then the other areas of your life, even though they may be protected, are more vulnerable. Yeah. Right. 
But when you have a shield, you have now a space between that which is on the outside of being attacked and that which is on the inside. You have a shield of faith. Notice, let me read this again. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows, King James says, darts of the evil one. The shield of faith gives you three things. Number one, I'm going to talk about, gives you perspective in prayer. Notice the emphasis on the evil one. Too many people don't know who they're fighting. They fight people, they fight the boss, they fight politics, they fight society. They don't understand that there is a force behind driving many, if not all of those people that are in positions of power. Do you hear me? I'm not political. Even when we tell you to vote, I I have a three-point position on voting. I encourage you to get information and don't use one source as your only source of information. Number two, pray because we all need God's direction and wisdom. And number three, vote because it's your constitutional right that has been purchased by the blood of men and women who've gone to battle for our freedom. But too many people, they'll fight over politics. Are you Republican, Democrat, Independent? And they don't understand that there is an evil force behind the scene directing all parties. Not everybody in every party. And there's good people in each party. But to tell me that the people of power, power is a dangerous thing. Power is a dangerous thing. Power in the hands of people who aren't right with God is, is horrible. Power can be a dangerous, seductive thing. And people don't want to give up power. The enemy seduces people. It's in politics. It's in government. It's it's in business. you got to understand, you you can blame the school system. You can blame politics. You can blame people of other race. You can blame people of other jobs. You can blame people that are rich. You can blame people that are poor. We've all heard some slant of some of those, if not all of those. But at the end of the day, the battle's not with people. The battle's against the devil. He's the one that is motivating. He's the one that is driving. He's the one that's imprisoned and bound people. It's easy to blame people for problems and we don't feel justified that we had to do anything. No, we're going to rise up. You have power in your prayer. So we fix, 2 Corinthians 4, 18 tells us, so we fix our eyes on what is seen, not what is seen, but what is not seen or unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Here's what the devil tries to do. The devil will try to get you to focus on what you feel. The devil will try to get you to focus on what you can touch. But the Bible refers to the things around you in this moment as temporal. Now, that's where we get the word temporary. And in the original text, you could define, it's defined this way. Things that are subject to change. Has your emotions ever changed? Has your feelings ever changed? If you're in the dating, if you're in a relationship, you have... Your emotions, I love him, I love him. Mm, I don't want to be around him today. (laughs) Has your income ever changed? Has your body and how you feel physically ever changed? It's subject to change. The devil will try to tell you that 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 which is temporal, symptomatic, is permanent. And God said there's only one thing that's eternal, Psalms 119, and that's the establishment of his word. What is he saying? Don't be moved by what you feel here. See, be moved by the truth of the word of God. And when there's a storm beating on your house and the devil says, your house is caving in. You're going to get flooded out. You don't have a place to live. You're going to be homeless. Say, nope, nope, nope. The word of God says, I have, because I have heard and obeyed the word, my house is built on something stronger. It's built on the foundation. You don't see foundations of homes. People don't walk by and say, woo, look at the foundation of that house. It doesn't get much attention until there's a storm. You don't look at the root system of a tree. It doesn't get much attention until there's strong winds. But he, the the Bible says in Psalms 1, that those who are planted in the house of God, guess what? They have a root system. They have a root system that has access to life and water and nutrients that doesn't have to come from an occasional rain. They have access to what is not seen. Second Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Back to our key verse, Ephesians 6, verse 16. 
In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows. Say all the arrows. Say just not some of them, all of them. Just not a few of them, all of them. This is what's available to you and I. We're all growing. Say, I'm growing. So if you're not there, don't get upset. But all the arrows, all the arrows, all the arrows, all the arrows. The shield of faith will not only give you a perspective in prayer, the shield of faith gives you power in prayer. When you begin to operate and lift up that shield, what are you saying? You're telling the arrows that used to hit you, no more. You are drawing a line in the sand. You are creating a boundary and saying no farther than that. I might not be able to stop an arrow from coming my way, but I can stop it from getting to me. Are you listening to me? You have authority with the shield of faith. You lift up the shield of faith and it stops it. Those arrows might hit it, but they don't hit you. They're hitting the shield. They're hitting the shield. They're hitting the shield. They're hitting the shield shield provided by faith. They are a barrier of protection. Are you listening to me? And though it might be a storm around you, it's not getting on the inside of you. You have drawn the line and said enough is enough. You maybe have gotten by with it before, devil. You maybe have attacked me and snuck out, and I blamed others, devil. But as of me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And as of, as of this day, enough is enough. I won't tolerate it. I won't accept it. Are you listening to me? Some of you got to get a little tenacity in you. You got to get a little fire in your eyes. You quit allowing the enemy to kick your teeth in, in the area of your finances, in the area of your mind, in the area of your emotions, in the area of your relationship. We allow the devil to do what he once he comes and goes sometime and we said oh I guess it is what it is no shut the door Jesus canceled in Mark, 4, in Mark 11. Look it up in your own time. Jesus came to a fig tree expecting figs because he saw the leaves. And when there was none, the Bible says that he canceled the assignment. That's my translation. He canceled its assignment. He canceled the assignment of the one who created it for him. That, that fig tree was created by God. That fig tree was created by the word of God. For John 1 tells me that all things were created by him and for him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. Are you listening to me, child of God? So the word of God, the heart of the Father, spoken out by the Spirit of God. The word of God created all things. And if the word created it, the word can cancel it. And so the word showed up at the, at the fig tree. And it was called and demanded, even though it wasn't its natural season. It was its divine season. Some of you are looking around and say, it's too late for me. That's the natural season. I'm telling you, there's another season that supersedes the natural season. And that's heaven's season. That's the divine season. Well, I'll never get there now. That's the natural season. Begin to step into the supernatural season. Oh, it's too late for me. That's the natural season. Begin to step into heaven season. And when Jesus showed up, when the word showed up, when heaven began to make a demand on what was created in the natural to produce supernatural, all of a sudden he saw that the fig tree had no figs. And Peter called it a curse. He didn't curse it. He didn't cuss it out. He didn't speak death to it. He canceled its assignment. No man will eat from you ever again. And he walked on. The word has enormous power. Let me give you another example. Because the Bible tells us by two or three witnesses, let everything be established. Jesus went in a boat. He told the disciples, let's get in the boat and go to the other side. And then he decided, I'm going to rest on the journey. I'm going to sleep. I'm going to sleep on a pillow. So never tell me that Jesus didn't have a pillow. And as he was asleep on the pillow, the Bible says, the storm, unexpected storm came up. This isn't a little rowboat. This is a little boat. It was a bigger boat. And some of the disciples were full-time fishermen. They were professionals. So they knew how to handle a boat. They knew how to handle a storm. But a storm in the original text says an unexpected storm monsoon basically an unexpected they didn't see it coming major storm has a storm has the devil ever attacked you with a storm that you didn't see coming you know in the old testament isaiah it says that he, that he, the enemy would come in like a flood 
But actually, it's a wrong translation. It does say, when the enemy comes in like a flood, that the Spirit of the Lord will set up a standard against him. Because there's no comma in the original text. A better translation, because a flood means uncontainable. The devil is not uncontainable. It might feel uncontainable, but that's in the realm of your emotion, not in the realm of faith and reality. In reality, only God is uncontainable. Yeah. David said, you have no boundaries. He has, you can't measure God. And so actually, it, 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 it actually better interpreted saying that when the enemy comes in, like a flood, the Holy Spirit will step in. When the enemy comes in, like a flood, the Spirit of God will step in. When the enemy comes in, the Holy Spirit will step in like a flood and set up a standard. Are you listening to me, child of God? And so Jesus was asleep. He was resting. And an unexpected storm came in. Are you guys doing okay? And an unexpected storm came in. And an unexpected storm came in and began to freak them out to where they begin to panic. They begin to worry. And just like many times we do in our own life, when storms come in, we think, I got it. And we try to handle it on our own. I got it. I'll make it work. I got it this time. And then all of a sudden when it's not working, we begin to panic. We begin to sink. We begin to worry. And guess what they did? They begin to blame Jesus. Don't you even care. If someone came to you, your children did that, you'd be like, why are you blaming me? I didn't create the storm. Right. Don't you even care that we're, all, that we're all about to die? And the Bible says that Jesus did something. He said he stood up. Stay with me. Because when you understand who you are and your authority, we talked about kingdom mindset, covenant mindset. You're going to stand up when everybody's trying to hide. You're going to stand up when everybody's trying to get lower. When you're in the boat and the wind is blowing, you don't want to stand up to the pressure of the wind. Most people in the world will never stand up to the pressure of the wind. Most people in the world are looking for an escape hatch to find a corner in a dark place hidden that they don't have to deal with the problems of life. But I'm talking to men and women of God, not baby Christians. I'm talking to men and women of God that knows what it means that when the wind is blowing the hardest, that's the time to take a stand. Don't tell me I got to fit in and get in and follow the trend. No, that's the time to stand up for righteousness. And Jesus stood up. Amen. The word will cause you to stand up. And Jesus stood up. And what did he do? He rebuked the wind. He rebuked, he bound that which was causing the problem. And then he didn't rebuke the waves. What did he do to the sea? He spoke peace. He restored what was supposed to be. We're rebuking people. No, you have an authority. Matthew 18, 18. Jesus said, I give you the keys of the kingdom and what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Another translation amplified says it this way, Matthew 18, 18. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, whatever you bind, forbid, declare improper and unlawful. To declare, to declare, to declare to declare to be improper. See, most people are embracing the attack of the enemy and they're trying to get along with everybody. Let's just all put a coexist bumper on our car and just say kumbaya, let's all be friendly and happy toward each other. But that's not what Jesus did. That's not what Jesus did. That's not the heart. You don't understand. When Jesus came to the temple and they were defiling the temple by uh, bringing merchants, uh, merchants on the inside of the temple and they were selling and actually stealing from people as they were overselling uh, uh, minor or defective products to be worshipped, used as worship. Jesus flipped the table. He took, he made some strength and beat them out of there. Well, most Christians in modern day, they would quickly get on YouTube and videotape that and all of a sudden post it. I think that Jesus has just lost it. He's, he's got a temper problem. He is, he's all messed up now. I think some Christians would have, uh, would have factioned off or made a small minority group and they would have said, oh, that's not right. We should love everybody. Everybody's important. And so let's just go and help them pick up the coins that were knocked down and reset up the table. Let's help them just do it, the operating the way they can do it. That's just them. That's the way God made them. And let, no, Jesus flipped the tables. And you know what came to the disciples? The scripture out of the Old Testament that said, my zeal, the zeal for your house has consumed me. What was saying? The zeal for the honor of God has consumed me. God didn't call you to be a sissy. God didn't call you to get along with everybody. You don't have to be rude.
rude to people. But the reality is, if there's evil, and the end of evil is trying to cross the boundary of who God's called you to be, and what God's called you to do, and what God's called you to achieve, you have an authority to rebuke it, to, to, to declare out of your mouth that this is not proper. It is unlawful. Last but not least, the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows. I love tactics. I love strategies of war. And in those days, this is one of the ways they would fight. And so they had arrows that they would shoot, and that worked. Until all of a sudden, someone figured out, let's create a shield, then we can protect ourselves. So then they figured, well, if they got shields that will stop the arrow, let's put fire to it. Because even if we hit the shield that, that might not hit them, if we can put fire to it, it'll spread. Fire has a tendency to spread. Because the initial shields were made out of hay, not out of metal. And so when the fire spreads, it begins to consume. You say, well, I don't have a shield. What are you talking about, Pastor? Oh, yeah, has the devil ever attacked you in the area of your mind, and all of a sudden you just felt the fire of torment and fear? It don't even have to happen to keep you up at night. It doesn't have to be a reality to move you out of position of strength if you allow it. It's you, all of a sudden your imagination, your mind, your emotions. What is that? That's the fire of the arrow of the enemy. Maybe you're dealing with that today. Maybe you're fighting that today. Oh, Pastor, when I lay my head on my pillow, I, I, I just... I just see all these horrible things happening to my family. Oh, I just see them all dying of COVID. I see, I see the boss firing me and we losing our house and being homeless. Oh, pastor, I see people turning on me and no one's still helping me. The devil will always bring the worst case scenario. Listen, I'm not denying the existence of a, a virus called COVID. I will tell you, in my opinion, you can take it or like it, that people in power have created more fear over it than was necessary yes. to gain and move society's opinion to do what they want. Yes. And I'm not blaming one party or the X. They're all, they'll all do the same thing. Yes. I like what Jonathan says. It's a, it's a two-headed snake. So, I mean, which one you want to pet or hold, I don't, it don't matter to me. We have to follow the word of God and not be moved by what we feel here or see. Begin to say, wait a minute, as far as me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The fire of the arrow is fear and torment. The fire of the arrow is the fatigue of you trying to do it on your own. Hebrews 4.10 says, For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works. The shield of faith not only gives you perspective and prayer, power and prayer, but gives you peace and prayer. You're not, you're, you can pray with urgency that comes from the fire of the word, but not panic that comes from the fear of the enemy. Amen. See the difference? It's so subtle. The many people miss it. Some are praying with so much energy, but it's from the fear of the enemy and not from the fire of the word. But when you have the shield of faith, you realize it's not about you, it's about what God can do. Just like Caleb and Joshua said, God is well able. We are well able because God will put them in our hands. What were they saying? We are going into the promised land and we are taking it because God is on our side. David said to the king, I, King, your servant David will take this giant. I'll deal with him. And he stood before Jol uh, Goliath and said, this day your head will be removed. This day I'm going to cut off your head. That is a declaration of faith because he didn't even have a sword. But you don't always have to understand how it works. You just simply believe Amen. and obey. Amen. And when you begin to stand and say, I don't know how God's going to do it. I don't know when God's going to do it. Like we've taught you before, when you don't know how, when you don't know when, when you don't know where, don't feel panic. All you need to, do, need to know is who. Yeah. If you know that God is on your side. Yeah. And with him, all things are possible to him who believes. Amen. Yeah. The devil will try to get you in the battle. Well, how's that going to happen? I don't need to know how. Why is it? Why did that even happen? I don't need to go down that road. All I need to focus on is on who. Amen. 
he will give you peace. Philippians 4, verse 6 through 7. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. In closing, the shield of faith gives you a perspective in prayer. The shield of faith gives you a power in prayer. And the shield of faith gives you a peace in prayer. Amen. There still might be storms. But on the inside, you have a peace that exceeds your understanding, which means you don't know how or why it's working, but you have it. A peace that, a peace, a peace that exceeds, doesn't make sense to your natural reasoning. Peace that, in prayer. So let me encourage you, take the shield of faith and extinguish all the fiery darts of the enemy today. In Jesus' name. If you believe you received that, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. If you bow your head and close your eyes, no one looking around. If you're here today and do not have a real relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm not asking if you know about God. I'm not asking you to join a church, denomination, or religion, even though we would love to have you as a regular part of our family. I'm asking you this one question only. Is Jesus Christ real to you today in a way that you know for yourself that he's real and your Lord and Savior? Only you can answer that. It's not about jumping through hoops and the rules of man. It's about a real relationship with Jesus. Is he real in your life in a way that you understand, process, and experience that you know without a question or a doubt that he's real? And number two, that he's your Lord and Savior. If you don't have that, you can have that today. Jesus said in Revelation 3, I stand at the door and I knock. If you hear my voice and open up, I'll come in. It's given him an opportunity. He's already paid the price. He's waiting for you to draw near, and he'll draw near to you. So let this prayer come from your heart. I'll lead you in a prayer. Let this prayer come from your heart. Say with me, Heavenly Father, I repent of all my sins. I turn to you today. I open up my heart. Jesus, I recognize, I acknowledge that you are the Son of God, that you came to this earth in the flesh. You died on a cross for me. You were buried for me. And on the third day, you rose again for me. Because I believe that, I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart, wash me in your blood, forgive me, cleanse me, give me a fresh start. Say, Jesus, I don't want a religion. I want a real relationship with you. So I open up my heart, and I invite you in to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer and say, Pastor, that prayer was for me, just so I knew who I was praying with, at the count of three, I want you to just lift your hand and wave them at me in this size congregation. It's a little harder to see sometimes, everybody, but lift your hand real high so I can see it and wave. One, two, three. Pastor, that was for me. Who was it? See the hand. God bless you. Second, third, fourth hand, fifth hand. God bless you. Over here. Anybody? Sixth hand. God bless you. In the center. Seventh hand. God bless you. Anybody else in the center? Over to the right. Anybody? Eight. God bless you in the far back right. God bless Anybody else? Anybody else? I feel there's somebody else. Who are you? You say, what is it? Thank you. God bless you. Nine. Anybody else? Lift your hand real quick. Let me pray over you. Father, for everyone who raised their hands in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, according to your word, I ask you to give them supernatural strength and boldness in their inner man by your spirit. I thank you for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Right now, anoint them, strengthen them. Let them never be the same as they walk out of here. They will never be passive against sin again. They will be strong in the Lord and the power of your might. I thank you for supernatural power and strength in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Listen, I want you, go ahead, give the Lord a hand clap of praise for that. Isn't that awesome?